Good evening and welcome. I am so pleased to welcome Linda McLean, Sumner McLean, and Wendy Jones on our stage tonight. Both Linda and Sumner McLean love to perform stories together, celebrating life. They strongly believe that through the art of storytelling, poetry, music, and movement, we are awakened to the valuable stories of our past and present. We hope you enjoy tonight's performance of Daddy King. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, if you could hear me, put your hand on your nose. If you can hear me, put your hands on your head. If you can hear me, put your hands on your knees. You have a great audience. Give yourself a hand. Okay, so this is a very special time. Storytelling is a wonderful moment of sharing. And since we're talking about Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and let's give him a good hand for the birthday. It's good that we're all starting on one accord, sort of like all of us are together, all in one harmony, all in one rhythm. And so we're going to do something with the drum, because in some cultures, the drum is a way of bringing people together. So I'm going to play this drum. This drum is called the djembe. Can you say djembe? djembe. Yeah, this is a djembe drum. I want you to clap like this. like your heartbeat, isn't it? Everybody has a beat that their heart goes to, and so is the drum. Very good, give us some time. Okay, we're gonna do a little rhythm kind of thing, and I'm gonna take the tambourine a little bit here, and I want you to clap like this. And we're gonna do something called call and response, okay? So that's a my turn, your turn. So when I say doctor, you say Luther. Doctor, Luther. Good. If I say doctor, you say Martin. Doctor, Martin. Doctor, Martin. Okay. When I say doctor, you say Martin. Doctor, Martin. Doctor, Martin. When I say Luther, you say King. Luther, King. Luther, King. Now let's see if you can bring it up just a little bit stronger. When I say doctor, you say king. Doctor, king. Doctor, king. When I say Martin, you say Luther. Martin, Luther. Martin, Luther. Doctor, king. Good, good job. Okay, excellent. So there's something else that they do in some cultures too, and this one is from Ghana in West Africa. When they want someone to give ear, they say, I go. And I go means that you are really listening. So if I say to you, I go, and I want you to make sure that you're here, you're going to answer by saying, I may. So if I say, I go, you say, I may. I go. I I go. I I go. I know you're ready to hear this story. But this is a very special time, talking about Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. When we say Jr., we know that he was named after someone else, and that was his dad. And we know that none of us do anything without standing on the shoulders of somebody else who came before us. So Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King, he was a very special man who believed in freedom for everyone in the land. 
But he was an ordinary guy who was used to do something extraordinary, just like each and every one of you can do. Everyone that's sitting out here, whether you're very little or very big, has a potential of doing some very, very great things. And what you might not know is that Dr. Martin Luther King, even when he was a very little boy, and he saw somebody bullying somebody, he didn't just sit and watch it. Even when he was little, this story said that someone was teasing one of his friends because he had a short pants instead of long ones, and he said, hey, stop that. And one of the guys came to say, who do you think you are to tell us what we can do? And he said, I'm his friend, and my name is Martin, and I said so. Well, he said it in a firm voice, but he didn't fight him, and he didn't push him, but he was firm and he was strong. And you know what? Those boys left him alone. So there's many stories about Dr. Martin Luther King, but what I want you to know that even if you're a child and you're very young, there are things that each and every one of us, young or old, can do to make a positive difference in this world. Now, I didn't know Dr. Martin Luther King personally myself, but my father did. My father is 88 years old now. He's a year older than what Dr. Martin Luther King would be at this point. But what I do know, and maybe you don't know, living in Massachusetts, that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spent a lot of time in Massachusetts, particularly Boston. And my family church, which is 12th Baptist Church in Roxbury, Massachusetts, he was actually a Sunday school teacher and an associate pastor. He met his wife in Boston. They lived in Boston for a while, and he actually came to my grandmother's house sat down in the kitchen with my, my father and aunts and uncles, and you know what one of his favorite dishes were? Rice and chicken. <laughs> Just like rice and chicken. Some people have rice and chicken tonight. So the point is that Dr. Martin Luther King was a very special man, ordinary in many ways, but used in an extraordinary way. So tonight, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to my husband, Sumner McLean, who's going to tell you about the story of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. during that civil rights movement when people were just putting their foot forward and they were like, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around, ain't gonna let nobody Turn me around, I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, going to the promised land. Oh, keep on a walking, keep on a talking, going to the promised land. And that's what the people believed. They were gonna get their freedom and they're gonna keep on walking and keep on talking till they got to the freedom land. I introduce you to Summer McLean. What an honor and a privilege it is to be here today to celebrate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, there is something I was sharing with the younger people earlier about this particular school. It's a very special place. It, there's a very special connection here. There's a love of education here. And so it's even more exciting to be in a place like this. I go to a lot of schools, and oftentimes they're under a lot of stress. But there seems to be a lot of joy in this place. And uh, I'm so glad to be having the opportunity for us to share, share it with you. Um, the story of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, as it was told in the original narrative that I wrote, started many years ago. Because you see, I used to work in a school system and I was having lunch <clears throat> with a group of fourth graders. And I happened to be asking them at the time, what do you know about Dr. King? I got some strange answers. One person said he tried to help black people. Another person said, I'm not sure, but there's a holiday coming up and I'm gonna get to do what I wanna do. And another person said, he died. <laughs> and then I asked them a very important question for pe young people their age. I said, I asked them, I said, is there anything in your life worth dying for? And one of the girls at the table said, yes. 
If my mother was crossing the street and there was a truck coming, I would run right out there and try to save her. I said, that's wonderful. And then I looked to a, at a boy at the table and I said, well, what about him now? Would you, would you try to save him? She said, no. <laughs> But, you know, if there was a truck coming, I would yell, Hey, there's a truck coming. You better get out the way. <laughs> I'll never forget that uh, that day, one of the young people had brought a pink bunny and a gray bunny, and it was sitting up on the table. And I said, you know what? Let me see if I can explain a little bit about Dr. King using these two bunnies. I said, let's make believe. Let's make believe these two bunnies are on their way to McDonald's to get a Big Mac. And they hop right into McDonald's. And uh, you know that uh, clerk with the golden arch hat looks at Pink Bunny and says, come right in, Pink Bunny. Sit down. What would you like? Uh, deluxe Coke? A Big Mac? Excuse me, Great Bunny, but where are you going? Oh, no, 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 no. You can't hop in here and be served here in the front of the store. Mm -mm. We don't allow great many uh, uh, to do that. Go around to the side. We'll get to you when we can. One of the young people at the table said, that's how it was, wasn't it? For black people. I said, yes. That's how it was, not only for black people, but for white people, too. Because you see, it wasn't that long ago that in many places in our country, uh, it was against the law for you and I to walk into a restaurant, sit down, and have a hamburger together. And Dr. Martin Luther King gave his life to change that and to change many other things as well. And so I told myself, this is a story that belongs to all of us I need to find a way to tell it. But you know, I, I grew up in a foster home. I used to had some very sad times. But one of the beautiful things I used to do was go to the library and read a lot of stories. I love the stories that began with once upon a time and they lived happily ever after. Those stories made me feel so much better inside. And so I wasn't sure I wanted to tell this story because it didn't seem to have a happy ending. But because it belonged to all of us, I thought to myself, let me research it. Let me try to find a way to tell it. Maybe there's some joy in it. Maybe there's some, something in it that, that will make a difference. Maybe there'll be some healing in it. So I started researching the story. I read as many books as I could. I went to Atlanta. I went to uh, Reverend Martin Luther King's church. I talked to some of the older people. I went to his birthplace. I spent quite a few months researching it. And then one day, I found it. I didn't find a, uh, it wasn't that it, it was a sad ending. What I found in the story was a happy beginning. A happy beginning for all of us. All of us. And I thought to myself, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell that story. But from what perspective, I thought, should I tell it? And soon after I asked that question, I discovered that Dr. Martin Luther King's father, Daddy King, Reverend Martin Luther King Sr., after his son died, would go around to many places, such as this, schools like this, and tell the story of his son's life. And I said, that's what I want to do. Being a dad's been very important to me. I'm going to tell that story through the eyes of his dad. And that's what I've been doing for quite a few years. So that's what I want to share with you today. I want us to make believe that Dr. Martin Luther King Sr. walked right in here. The whole spirit of what that man and that legacy was all about walked right in here and is going to tell that story for all of us to share tonight. You know, um, when he did it, he would usually bring somebody from his church. Uh, somebody to do a beautiful dance or somebody to sing a song of great hope and faith. And then they would announce him. They would say, you know what? After the song, we are so pleased to have Reverend Martin Luther King Sr. here today 
the, the one we know as our beloved Daddy King. After the song, the next words you'll hear will be from Daddy King. on a Saturday morning, and my wife Bunch, her name's her brother, but I call her Bunch because she's my bunch of loveliness, <laughs> had a difficult birth. Do you know sometimes uh, when, the, when a baby's first born, the doctor has to slap it real hard to get it breathing? The doctor had to slap ML real hard to get him breathing. 
I guess you could say this whole thing started with a slap on the backside. When that doctor announced that I had a son, as short as I was, I jumped up and touched the ceiling. A son! <laughs> Bunch and I had three children. There was Christine, the oldest, and Alfred, we called A.D., the youngest, and Martin was our middle child. We called him M.L. M.L. They were all born 501 Auburn Avenue in Atlanta, Georgia. We called that place Sweet Auburn. We had a great big house and a, and a wonderful backyard with magnolia trees and a, and a white rocking chair swing. Our whole life was centered around the church. I was pastor of Ebenezer, and my wife Bunch was the choir director. And do you know M.L. when he was little, seven years old? Why, he sang in the children's choir. Oh, I think I hear him now in that rocking chair swing, singing songs like, This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Whoa, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, even in my school he would sing, I'm gonna let it shine. Even in my home, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. You know, I brought my kids up uh, with a sense of values. Every time they would get into that foolishness of fighting with one another, I would say, no, 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 no. You love one another. Do unto others as you have them do unto you. I made sure those children had chores and, 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 and had a, learned a sense of responsibility from, from early life. But I'll tell you, those values got tested. Oh, I remember one day, ML, he wanted to go downtown with me uh, to get a pair of shoes. I said, come on, boy, let's go. And we were downtown, he walked by the store, and he saw a nice pair of shoes. He said, Daddy, can I get those? Come on in, son, I said. <laughs> we walked in, and the clerk looked at me and said, I'm sorry, sir, but you know, we don't, we don't serve colored here in the front of the store. I said, what? You mean you're not going to be serving us like, like other folks? Well, we won't be buying any shoes here today. I grabbed ML's hand, and we walked on out of there. Had too much pride for that. Oh, the values got tested. Uh, he used to play with Tommy, the white grocer's son. When he was real young, they used to play baseball and football and, and, and ride their bikes together. But one day, he knocked on Tommy's door, and Tommy's mother, he said, can Tommy come out and play? Tommy's mother said, no, not today. He came back again and he said, can Tommy come out today and play? She said, no, no, not today. Well, ML wouldn't give up, so he went a third time and knocked on the door. Can Tommy come out today? His mom said, no. No, he can't come out. Do you understand that you're colored and he's white? You're going to different schools next year? There's no point in you all playing together anymore. His heart was broken. He didn't understand that. He said, Mama, Mama, what's the problem? Bunch tried to explain to him that some people are prejudiced. They'll judge you according to the color of your skin. But she said, look, don't you let that make you think you're ever not as good as other folks. Oh, the values got tested. One time he was at the mall, milling through the mall with, with Bunch, and she said all of a sudden she heard slap, and he was holding his cheek. Mama, Mama, that woman said that I, that, that I stepped on her foot. Mama, I didn't step on her foot, and she called me terrible names. Why, Mama? Bunch tried to explain to him. There was a time in our country when black folks were slaves. But even though the Emancipation Proclamation had been signed for over 200 years, we still were not free. She reminded him again, don't you ever let that, though, make you think you're not as good as other folks. But what could he think? He grew up and he, and he saw the signs, the signs that said white and colored everywhere he went, white and colored water fountains, 
white and colored restaurants, white and colored uh, gas stations, even white and colored cemeteries. He didn't let that separate him, though, from his friends and books. Do you know he loved to read? Oh, he loved school. He loved to read the stories of great Americans like Abraham Lincoln, and George Washington, and Sojourner Truth, and Frederick Douglass, and George Washington Cobb. By the time he was 15, he had skipped two grades and got accepted into a fine black college in the South, Morehouse. You heard of it? Morehouse College. That's where I went to school. <clears throat> that was the kind of place when you first went there, they would ask you a very important question. What are you going to do with your life? Are you going to do something good and important with your life? At first he thought, I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a doctor. I can help heal the sick. After all, he thought, no. After about a year, I thought about it again, and he said, I'm, I'm going to be a lawyer. That's what I'm going to be. I can help my people have their day in court. By the time he got to his senior year, don't you know, he changed his mind again. And he decided to be a minister. My boy, a minister. Oh, I was so proud. You're going to be a minister just like your dad. No, dad, he said. I'm not trying to be like you. It's just, Dad, that I just know that there's a lot of things wrong with our society that need to be healed. And I want to do something about it. And I know I'm going to need God's help to do it. I said, well, go on, son. He went to Grosher, Pennsylvania to study the ministry. And that was a, a, a strange place for him because there weren't many uh, colored folks in that school. So he used to wear a shirt and tie and polish up his shoes uh, and, 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 and always walk proudly because, you see, he, he was so afraid that the white folks were going to look at him and, and, and judge the whole black race by everything he said and did. Oh, oh, he wasn't there long before he met this student from North Carolina. Hadn't been around colored folks much. Every time he'd see ML coming up the, the, the sidewalk, He'd whisper to his friends, there goes Docky. I know him, I want to say, yeah, there goes Whitey. But he would never do that. Because you know he would be insulting the Creator, who has made us all so unique, all so beautiful. The students got together and they played a joke on that boy from North Carolina. <coughs> They, when he was at work, they went into his room, they put a whole lot of trash in his room, piled it to the ceiling. So when he came home and opened up the door, all that garbage and trash fell out on him. They told him that it was ML who did it. So he went to his car, he got a gun, and he came back to ML's dorm, knocked on the door, and when ML opened the door, he pointed that gun right at him. I know, you played a joke on me, huh? And I said, wait a minute. I didn't play a joke on you. Put that down. Can you, can, you, can you come in? Can we sit down? Can we talk about it? You see, ML had learned from his Bible stories. He had learned from his studies of Gandhi and Henry Thoreau that every time you have a conflict, you don't have to be violent. You can be creative. You can turn an enemy into a friend. You can say, come on in. Let's sit down. Let's talk about it. And you know, by the time the administration heard about the situation, they, were, they had worked it out. They were the best of friends. And then you know, he graduated from Grosse, and some of you know, he came up here to Boston University to get his PhD or doctoral in ministry. And that's where he met Coretta Scott. She was over at the New England Conservatory studying to be a singer. The last thing she wanted to do was be uh, uh, married to a minister. She said to me, um, Daddy King, uh, do you know what he said to me on the first date? I said, no. He asked me to marry him. I said, what? What did you say? I said, ML, you don't even know me. And he said, Coretta, I know you. 
You're intelligent. You got a great sense of humor. You got a sense of uh, uh, integrity. Are uh, you so gorgeous? I know I'm going to marry you. Oh, he knew how to talk to a lady. But you know, I wasn't so sure I wanted him to marry Coretta. I had somebody else in mind. And when I heard they were dating, I came right down, to Bo right down here to Boston, walked right into that, his apartment, and I said, ML, sit over here. I want to talk to this young lady. I looked right at Coretta and I said, Coretta, you know, uh, there are other uh, young ladies uh, back home that are uh, interested in him and have lots to offer. What do you have to offer? She looked at me and she said, Daddy King, I got lots to offer. And you know, she was right. Because as the times got tough, she got tougher. And she helped the family and this nation through many, many, many a difficult situation. I was so proud to marry them. And then uh, after he graduated from Boston University, he was, a, he was offered positions in universities to teach. I wanted him to come to Ebenezer and be my assistant pastor. But he said, no, Daddy. I got to make it out there on my own. So he accepted a position at Dexter Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. Oh, I wasn't so sure I wanted him working in that place. I remember I went there one day uh, on, on a business trip, and I was standing on the corner. The bus drove up. The driver told me to what? Get in the front door, put my dime in the meter, step off, and go around the back, and get in the rear door, and sit in the back. I didn't have time for that foolishness, but I was in a hurry. So I stepped on the bus, I put my dime in the meter, I stepped off the bus, I went around to get in the back door, when all of a sudden he slammed the doors and drove off, leaving me standing there, calling me names and laughing, humiliating me. Oh, I wasn't so sure I wanted my son working in that place. And you know, he wasn't there long before some of you know what happened. December 1st, 1955, a woman named Rosa Parks was riding one of those buses. And you know, the bus came to the stop through the colored section, and it filled up with colored folks. And then it went to the white section and filled up with white folks. Now, according to the law, half the bus could be for color, half the bus could be for white. But if uh, there was... Uh, Need, room needed for whites, the law said that colored folks had to get up and give up their seats. And on that particular day, the bus was overcrowded. So the driver said, all right, you all, point to the colored folks, get up, get up, get up and give up your seats. Some got up, but not Rosa Parks. She said that day she was tired. She was not only tired physically, she was tired spiritually. Because you see, they had been working for years to try to change those conditions. Black folks were 80% were of the ridership. Couldn't, they, couldn't get, they couldn't get jobs as bus drivers. They got humiliated uh, every, almost every time they rode the buses. Oh, she said, no, I'm not giving up my seat. So the bus driver, rode her to the nearest police station and had her arrested. She said she was praying all the way there, not only for her safety, but for that bus driver who was caught up in such an evil system. Word spread all over, uh, all over, that Rosa Parks was in jail. What? That gentle lady? The secretary of the NAACP is in jail? Oh, we got to do something about that. That night they had a meeting. After they got her out of jail, they had a meeting and they started talking about that bus situation. Because you, you can understand how frustrated uh, they were about that. They said, you know what? We got to form a, 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 an organization. I know. Let's call it the Montgomery Improvement Association. We're going to need a leader. Somebody rose their hands and said, 
Um, I'd like to nominate the new pastor in town, that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He wasn't so sure he wanted to do that. He said, well, uh, 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 I, uh, I, I guess uh, I'll think about it. The next night, they had another meeting in a larger church and thousands of people came. And he spoke very differently. He said, you know, I promised to be your leader, but I need to make something perfectly clear. We must protest with Christian love and dignity so that when the history books are written, they'll say there go a mighty people that have injected into the veins of civilization new meaning. Now let me see, let me see the hands of those who think that we should boycott those buses. We should stay off those buses until conditions change. Let me see the hands. Let me see the hands. Let me see the hands. All the hands went up. <laughs> and the next Monday morning, 99% of the people didn't ride those buses. 80,000 or more stayed off those buses. Oh, they, they came with, in carpools. They came in taxis. They walked and some of them came marching. The children, your ages, <laughs> came out marching, singing songs like, Oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me. And before I'd be a slave, I'm going to be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Newspapers came out. The TV cameras were rolling. One of the reporters asked this little girl, little girl, why are you out here today? I'm out here for my freedom, she said. But then the police came with those German shepherd dogs to bite them. And the fire department came with those big hoses and slammed up water on them as they were kneeling in prayer. And oh yes, some of their homes got bombed. Coretta talks about how it was. They had their first baby, Yolanda, and she was sitting in the living room when all of a sudden she heard the splintering of glass. She had just enough time to grab the baby and go to the rear of the house when the whole front porch exploded. And people kept, kept, came running from everywhere. Dr. Martin Luther King's house has been bombed. They came with sticks and guns and rocks. <laughs> He walked out there that day, and he said to me, look, we'll not solve this problem this way. We, we, you'll never, never overcome a, a problem with hate. You can't overcome hate with hate. The only way to overcome hate is with love. Go home. Go home. There was an older man in the crowd looking and seeing that Dr. Martin Luther King was willing to, to love even though his home had been bombed? He said, all right, come on, you all. Let's go home. Let's go home. But my son, he told me he was quite shaken that day. He said that he, he, they had been off the buses for such a long time. They were so frustrated and scared that somebody was, more was going to get hurt. He, he said he went into his bedroom and he sat down and he started to pray. Precious Lord, please hold my hand. Lord, I'm tired. Lord, I'm weak. Lord, I'm so warm. I don't want anything. Precious Lord, take my hand.
take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me on. When the darkness appears. And the night draws near, and the day is past and gone. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me home. And God heard his prayer. Because after over 380 days of 80,000 people staying off those buses, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that segregation in Montgomery, Alabama was unconstitutional. Oh. They had a victory. And that victory echoed all across the country because there was not only segregation, in the south, it was in the north, the east, and the west. And there were many other problems that my son uh, and many of us were concerned about. And he started to speak up about it. There were boys and girls of all colors in this country going to bed without supper. And he, he stood up and started talking about it. There was homelessness going on, and he stood up and started talking about it. There was a terrible war going on in Vietnam, and he stood up. And as he did, the telephone started ringing. People started calling him up and telling him, you better shut up. You better not say any more about this. We'll kill you. I didn't want anything to happen to my son. I said, look, look, look at Mel. You got a victory in Montgomery. There's no point in you putting yourself and the family in any more danger. Take one of the positions up at the college or come and be my associate pastor. No, Daddy, he said, my job's not finished. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to organize a whole lot of people to go to uh, Washington, D.C. and end poverty in America. I said, what? <laughs> he did. August of 1963, I was there. I, there was more than a quarter of a million people out there in front of the Lincoln Memorial. Oh, Jews, Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, all, all joining hands and singing songs like, We shall overcome, we shall overcome, deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome. Oh, they sang, we'll walk hand in hand. We'll not be afraid, for we shall overcome someday. He didn't get to speak till about 3.15 in the afternoon. And I was sitting there looking, looking at him, now a man, and I thought to myself how it was when he was a little boy. Bunch used to tell me that when, when he listened to me speak, he, he sometimes would whisper to her, hey, mama, mama. One of these days, I'm going to get me some big words. <laughs> oh, he didn't know that one day his big words would knock down some of those walls between us. Yes, 
somebody announced around 315, now I give you the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And I, and I whispered to him, make it plain, son. Make it plain. And he, and he stood up there after a 15-minute almost uh, standing ovation. And he said, you know, I have a dream this afternoon that this nation shall rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. I have a dream this afternoon. After a while, it seemed as if he wasn't reading so much his speech anymore. He was speaking from his heart. He said, I have a dream this afternoon that my four little children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream this afternoon. Not too long after that, four children were killed when a bomb exploded in a local church while they were attending Sunday school. Not too long after that, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. He was shot down in the street. They say he was working to make America a better place for everyone and this world. And he was trying to end that terrible war in Vietnam. Oh, I know some of you know my son was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. But you know, he didn't accept it in, 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 uh, for himself. He accepted it in the name of all people that have the courage to stand up for righteousness and love and justice. The telephone kept ringing. The death threats kept coming. Now, I said to him, son, look, you need to slow down because he was being invited everywhere and he was spreading himself so thin he wasn't even getting home. To, very often to be with the, the kids and, and, and the wife. Yolanda talks about how it was when Daddy finally got to come home. She said there were two words that would just tickle them in that house. And those words were Daddy's home. Because you see, they would hear the car in the driveway and eight feet would come scurrying into the kitchen and they would start yelling, Daddy's home, Daddy's home, Daddy, 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 Daddy. And he would come in, the first thing he would do is line them up for hugs and kisses. He had a sugar spot on, on his face for each one of the kids. This was Dexter's and Martin's and Yolanda's and Bunny's. And then he'd line them up on the refrigerator and then he would say, jump! And they would jump into, their, into his arms. Yolanda talked about how wonderful it felt to jump into her daddy's arms. Son, you, you need to slow down. What do you mean? You, 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 you got to go to Memphis? Yes, Dad, he said. I got to go to Memphis. The garbage workers are on strike. They have low wages. They don't even have health benefits. I know that if I go there and speak up, I can make a difference. Son, please. Dad, I promise. And some of you know what happened there. April 15, 1968. He was staying at the Lorraine Motel. And unbeknownst to him, there was a man named James Earl Ray that was sitting up in a rooming house right across the street from that hotel. That man had been stalking him for months, waiting for an opportunity to kill him. They say he was, he was standing on the balcony and with Ralph Abernathy, one of the local ministers, and it was a cold, chilly day. And, and, and Ralph said, you know, Dr. King, it's cold out here. I, I'm going in and get myself an overcoat. He said he was leaning over the balcony, talking to Ben Branch, one of the local aides in the church where he was to speak that night. He said, hey, Ben, tonight at the service, uh, would you ask your wife to uh, sing my favorite hymn? Great is my faithfulness. And oh, she's going to cook up some dinner? Some chicken and rice that I like? Wonderful. They say it sounded like a stick of dynamite. The 
it suddenly came out of nowhere. And the next thing they knew, he was lying there. I wasn't there. I was on my way to church with Bunch. We drove into the parking lot and I saw a whole people, a whole lot of people yelling, Daddy King, Daddy King. I knew something was wrong. We hurried into the church. Somebody had the television on. I heard the newscaster say that Dr. Martin Luther King had been shot. Bunch, Bunch started crying. We started praying. Twenty minutes later, the newscaster came back on and said that my son had died. People ask me, they say, Daddy King, why do you tell that story? You must be very, very bitter. I tell them, no, I'm not bitter. I'm grieving. I feel sad. I feel disappointed. But, but I'm not bitter. They say, Daddy King, didn't, didn't a mentally ill person come into your church, start spraying bullets all over the church, and one of those bullets struck a bunch and killed her suddenly? Oh. Daddy King, you must be bitter. Daddy King, do you remember when they found your son Alfred floating upside down in the swimming pool? You don't know to this day how he died. <coughs> oh, you must be bitter. And I tell them the same thing I'm going to tell you now, my brothers and sisters. Something that my mama said to me on her deathbed. She said, son, don't you ever, ever let anybody make you stoop so low that you hate. Hate is something that'll eat you up. But love, love is something that we've been created for. Oh, I will never forget something that my son said about a month before he died. He said, you know, I don't know if I'm going to live a long life. But you know, I want to live a committed life. I don't know if, 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 if I'm going to have a funeral before you do, but if you, if you get to plan my funeral and you get to speak to people, don't talk too long. Don't spend a lot of time talking about my education and my awards. Those are not, import those are not Im important things. Those are very shallow things. Just tell them that. Dr. Martin Luther King tried to love somebody. That he tried to do, do God's will in his life. He tried to clothe the naked. He tried to feed the hungry. Oh, if you're going to call me anything, he said, call me a drum major. A drum major for love. A drum major for justice. A drum major for righteousness. Oh, I'm so glad to have had the opportunity to talk to you all today regarding my son's life. And I, and I just want to leave you with an important question. What are you going to do with your life? You're going to do something good and important with your life? I, I don't mean when you young people uh, grow up. I don't mean that. I, I, I don't mean some way off in the past. What I mean is, my son used to say, it really wasn't a battle between white folks and black folks. It really was a battle between good and evil. And that challenge tests us at any age. So what I'm really asking you is, oh, what are you going to do the next time somebody's trying to bully somebody? Are you going to stand up against it? Well, what are you going to do the next time there's a need in the community and somebody needs some help? What are you going to do? I, I hope that you're going to be a, a drum major, a drum major then for love. Oh, I'm not foolish enough to think that the love that my son preached about hasn't been on the earth a long, long time before he was born. You know, the seeds of that love lie within all of us, within you and you and you and you and you and me. So let's let there be peace on earth. And let it begin with me, and you, and you, and you, and you. God bless you.
Bye.